welcome to a conversation we're calling Equitable Education in a Time of Pandemic, a Capabilities Approach to Student Learning and Development. My name's David Peacock and I'm Director of Community Service Learning in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta here in Edmonton. I'd like to begin by saying that I'm speaking today from the Faculty of Education and that I respectfully acknowledge that our university is located on Treaty 6 territory, the territory of the Puppet's Chase, the homeland of the Métis Nation, and a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples. They're the traditional knowledge holders here. A short time ago, I hosted a conversation with three distinguished professors of education from South Africa, Australia, and Canada. Our discussions range from the capabilities approach to education, its purposes, and the pedagogical and curriculum challenges for an education inclusive of equity-seeking students, all in a time of pandemic. The goal of the discussion was to explore how this capabilities approach can act as an alternative to the more dominant learning outcomes framework called for in many jurisdictions and increasingly so within the province of Alberta. The pandemic has given us pause to prioritise what's most important in post-secondary education, what we're educating our students for and whom we want them to become. We think there might be value in opening up this discussion to a wider audience, and so we've edited this special video for you. A special thanks to the University of Alberta's Centre for Teaching and Learning and Faculty of Education for their support as well. Professor Walker is a world expert on the human development approach to education, a prolific scholar deeply concerned with questions of social justice and equitable outcomes through higher education. Her most recent work has been concerned with what she calls the preparation of public good professionals. Professor Lisa Wheelerhand currently works at the Department of Leadership, Higher and Adult Education at the Ontario Institute of Studies and Education, where she's the holder of the William Davis Chair in Community College Leadership. Originally from Australia, that's right, another one, Professor Wheelerhand is a tertiary education researcher interested in education policy, student equity, relations between the vocational higher education sectors and the role of knowledge in the curriculum. She too has been prolific in her academic writings, but also in contributing to public debates on post-secondary education, and particularly on the education skills employment nexus. And finally, Professor Jennifer Tupper, currently serving as the Dean of University of Alberta's Faculty of Education, is an award-winning teacher and researcher with expertise in critical citizenship treaty and anti-colonial education. Her work has been taken up extensively by scholars throughout the world as they address these issues and the challenges they hold for curriculum, pedagogy and social justice outcomes. So just a little background to our discussion today. Proponents of learning outcomes frameworks, such as the OECD through its assessment of higher education learning outcomes project, argue that they contribute to greater quality assurance for governments and communities for their post-secondary sectors. They enable the generation of better data for comparative assessment of tertiary institutions within and across nations, and also make more transparent to students what they're expected to know and to be able to do upon the achievement of their qualifications. Some even argue by making these requirements more transparent for students, those from less privileged backgrounds, perhaps without the familial experience of post-secondary education, have a greater chance of success. Yet the approach is not without its critics, as you'll hear in a moment. For them, the learning outcomes approach tends to reduce the purposes of post-secondary education to narrow economic measures and the building of human capital, and making tertiary education little more than a training ground for short-term labour market shortages. Most importantly for these critics, the approach sells students short and fails to prepare them for their lives as global citizens and critical problem solvers, the kinds of people I think we can agree we need as much now as ever. I began a conversation by asking each of the discussants about their local educational contexts and how their students and staff were being impacted by COVID. I hope you find it interesting too. Professor Walker, can you tell us a little bit about um, your work and uh, where it's located and then something about um, how the pandemic has been playing out for students as well as your colleagues? 
Um, thanks very much, David, and, and thank you for this opportunity to, to be part of a really interesting uh, panel. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what other people have to say. So I work at the University of the Free State uh, in Bloemfontein, which is central South Africa. It's relatively remote. It's about five hours by car from Johannesburg and about 11 hours by car from Cape Town, and I say by a car because one of the impacts of COVID has mean, means that you can no longer fly in and out of Bloemfontein. So if you want to get out, you're gonna to have to do it by car or by bus. Um, it's um, historically white Afrikaans speaking university uh, in a province in which, which is both the birthplace of the ANC and of Afrikaner nationalism. So you can imagine it's, it's, a, it's a strange and interesting sort of place. And it's semi-rural, so there's a lot of uh, farming that goes on in the province. Uh, in terms of the university, it's made real efforts and strides in terms of moving away from its background, not, not completely and not entirely. But the student demographic is now around 80% Black African students spread across three campuses, the city campus in Bloemfontein, the access campus um, about half an hour away, and the rural campus, which is about four hours by, by road. Uh, although we don't collect um, SES data, I mean, nationally, that's not part of the database. It's been race and gender and field of study, that kind of thing. I mean, increasingly now, because student financial aid um, is tied to family income, there, there's the beginning of, of mapping that, but I have to say it's quite uneven. But the majority of our students uh, come from low-income backgrounds, um, various uh, ethnic groups and language backgrounds um, as well. So, so they're quite diverse in that sort of way. We've got about 60% of our undergraduates are female, but the majority, the majority of our staff are white and the majority of our professors are, are male. So there's a bit of a mis mismatch between what the student demographic looks like and what the staff uh, demographic looks like. My university attained a certain notoriety back in 2008, 2009, over what came to be called the Rates Incident, where a group of white male students made um, a, a deeply, deeply racist video. It was so bad that it actually sparked off a, a national commission to look at racism in universities. So it's got, it's got that kind of very checkered history erupting at points of tension over, so most recently over the Fees Must Fall protests in 2015 and 2016. So it's, it's come a long way, but it's, it's got a fair way to go still. In terms of the group that I, I lead, it sort of coalesces around this uh, re research chair that I have in higher education and human development. It's very much an early career research group. So our numbers fluctuate, but they generally stabilize at around 20. But of those 20, there's myself as the professor, um, there's a senior researcher who's now five years out of her PhD, but everybody else is either a master student or a PhD student or a postdoc. So there's a very strong emphasis on capacity building in the group. Um, it's by and large um, a sub-Saharan African group, so we get students from Malawi, from Cameroon, Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, as well as from South Africa. We have slightly more women than we have men. Uh, everybody in their research is engaging either more specifically with human development or human development and capabilities around a higher education topic, which is of, of interest to them, whether it's uh, African feminisms or community engagement or rural development, whatever it may be. In terms of the COVID impact on the university and the country, so, so the country has actually handled it not, not too badly. Um, the death rate hasn't been too bad. It's been unfortunate, but not too bad. And we, it, it seems now to be receding. We'll wait and see if there's a second wave. The impact on education has obviously been really severe. So the students were all sent home in March. Our academic year runs from February to November. Um, they were all sent home. Um, and there had to be this very rapid and sudden switch to online learning. And in my own university, on the basis of not an awful lot of experience in doing this. And then, of course, students going back to townships and to rural areas were in contexts where they, they may not have had a laptop, they may not have had electricity, and they certainly didn't have easy access to data. 
So I think the experience has been very, very uneven for our students. And as usual, the most vulnerable students have lost out the most. And what I see as well, because we've had this longitudinal life history project. So the last wave of interviews were in April, May. So we asked about COVID. It's, it's also about learning disposition. Students who've come from a functional quality schools have have uh, learning disp dispositions which they can mobilize under these conditions and other students can't i mean they've actually they actually need the experience of going to a lecture theater even if the lecture is not much good uh, it gives them a kind of a structure and a plan for the day and the week and so on and i think there's been a huge struggle for mm. low income higher education students and that's going to have to be looked at very very carefully the resourcing for that, the, the training for that, because it does look as if we're going to move into a blended learning for the future because of social distancing and so on. And then the schooling impact has, has also been severe. Schools without water, schools that are very remote, issues of public transport, overcrowded classrooms and, and so on. So I think the, the impact on education has been severe and it's not clear yet how this is going to be dealt with, how it's going to be resourced how um, I mean there have been efforts so um, my own university purchased something like three and a half thousand laptops which were made available and got to students who need them there have been negotiations around uh, some free sites uh, where learning materials are are posted a certain amount of data has been made available for free to students it's not enough um, so, so some of those things are in place, but it's not enough. And if you want to talk about it in capabilities language, for some students, their capabilities haven't been impacted. For others, I think they've been quite severely compromised. I mm. think I'll stop there. Thank you for that, Melanie. And yeah, that's interesting, the differentiated impacts that you're describing there for, for student uh, from equity seeking backgrounds. Yeah. So I think we might um, then move to Professor Wheelahan if you could share something of your educational context, um, Professor. So um, I work at the University of Toronto, which is um, the biggest university in Canada and probably the most well resourced. Um, but that doesn't mean that its students necessarily all come from privileged backgrounds. In fact, um, it's a very diverse um, institution um, in many ways. Um, and from what we've been hearing, students have been feeling the impact of COVID enormously. In particular, I work at uh, OISE, which is the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. Um, and it's a graduate um, uh, only institution. So we um, focus mainly on um, teaching school teachers. Uh, but in the program that I work in, uh, higher education, um, we have a, uh, our focus is on preparing practitioners for the higher education sector. I lead the Community College Leadership PhD cohort. Um, this is the fifth cohort, uh, the sixth cohort, sorry. Uh, the, the first cohort started in 1999, and this is the sixth group of um, scholars from the college sector who are participating in our program. And most of them are uh, leaders of their, coll their college, um, you know, like deans or heads of program or vice presidents or something like that. Now, the college sector in Canada is something which Canada should be very proud of. It's a very strong, well-resourced, comparatively speaking, um, sector. It has many problems, of course. Um, it's very similar to colleges in Australia and colleges in the UK, but probably stronger and better resourced than those colleges. But like those colleges in Australia and UK, the, the population that it serves um, tend to come from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds, much more so than universities. And they also, in at least in Ontario, the province of Ontario, have a much higher proportion of students um, who are international students who are particularly suffering uh, during this um, pandemic. What I'm hearing from my students is that they are under enormous pressure um, as leaders of their institutions, trying to keep their institutions going and trying to support their students. Uh, 
many of their students don't have access to the kinds of resources that we've come to expect in rich countries as, as, as normal. Um, and so you find students sitting in car parks um, at college so they can use the internet, things like that. And the colleges have to keep the internet going, you know, throughout that period of time. The other particular difficulty for the colleges uh, is that many of their uh, programs have a practical component. And um, with the shutdown, of course, students weren't on campus. And now what they're trying to do is bring students back, um, you know, in shifts, um, socially distance and all of that, to try and help them do the practical component of their course, of their programs, to try and deal with the backlog of students. And this is hugely difficult and an underappreciated problem, I think. Yeah, my, that would be my assumption is that the college sector would pick up um, some uh, greater proportions of, of uh, equity seeking students, perhaps yeah. than, than higher education in Canada more generally. Although we don't measure the SES thing in Canada in the same way as in the UK or in Australia necessarily. So yeah. um, it's actually hard to get that kind of data. Lisa, I don't know if you know those that data. Um, so the college sector, yeah, I mean, there, there is some data, but it's pretty bad. Um, I mean, uh, Canada is good at many things, but data is not one of them, um, I'm afraid. It, uh, the data here is just appalling. Um, but there, there, there are some data, and what it does show is that um, students who go to college are far more likely to be first generation, um, to attend post-secondary education, far more likely to come from racialised background, and far more likely to come from a low-income family. The colleges in particular have um, a, a, a large percentage of students in the north, particularly say in Ontario, the north of Ontario where there's large indigenous um, populations, uh, where they um, particularly support First Nations students and indigenous students. Um, and so they're very aware of, of the role that they play in the community and in society, and they're working very hard to fulfil their mandate but it's pretty difficult under the current circumstances, particularly compounded by the fact that um, there's been funding cutbacks, which have made it much more difficult. Um, this is the, the worst time that we could have had funding cutbacks, and yet that, uh, that, that's what they've had. The other problem for the college sector is that 70% of its teaching um, is done by contingent faculty. Um, that is part-time and sessional teachers, and they have been acutely disadvantaged in this whole process, not only in their own lives in terms of accessing an income um, and, you know, being able to know that they can support their family, but also in supporting their students. So, they, you know, the, the, I think the problems for the college sector reflect those for the university sector, but magnified. Mm, thank you for that. Professor Tupper, can you tell us about your context? Absolutely, and, and thanks David for organizing this conversation. I'm so grateful to be alongside Melanie and Lisa. Very privileged to be Dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Alberta um, in Amiskwiti, Wiscawigan, or Edmonton, Beaver Hills. Um, our undergraduate teacher education program is the largest in Canada with 3,000 students, um, almost 10% of whom self-identify as Indigenous, so we have 284 self-identified Indigenous students in our undergrad program. And we also have many first-generation university attenders because teaching as a profession has often been a vehicle for social mobility, for um, more um, equity-seeking groups who have been um, economically marginalized and disadvantaged. Uh, we have community-based programs through our Aboriginal teacher education programs. So we are in Masquachis uh, in Treaty 6. We are in Lakeland delivering the ATEP program. And we're also north. So we have our teacher education north program up in Grand Prairie, an undergrad elementary program, and then also at Keanu College in Fort McMurray, and a middle years uh, collaborative program in Red Deer, which is central Alberta.
Um, in addition, we have a thousand graduate students spread across, spread across 23 specializations, including uh, adult and community education, higher education, and Indigenous peoples education. Um, the diversity of research is significant in our faculty, but we do have um, some strengths in mental health and wellness education, um, in Indigenous education, and more recently, we've been having very focused conversations about how collectively we can uh, live out a commitment to truth and reconciliation education across all of our programs, grad and undergrad, and also how we might advance anti-oppressive education at a time where we see this work as critical um, in the province of Alberta for sure, but, but more broadly across the country and across the world. Um, one of the, the things that we have offered for a very long time um, are sexual and gender minority uh, studies services and research through our Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Studies, ISMIS. And in particular, ISMIS works with the K-12 um, landscape in the province to support mental health and well-being of LGBTQ2 plus uh, children, youth, and educators. And COVID was particularly challenging for ISMIS um, to continue to do its work because being in schools and creating those spaces of support is critical for vulnerable and marginalized populations. So we had to, as a faculty, sort of pivot with purpose and figure out how we could continue to support um, LGBTQ2 plus um, students in schools um, by moving everything online. And so that has been a huge learning experience for us and has also revealed um, equity issues around access. And I think both Melanie and, and Lisa have identified that. We've also seen the challenges for many of our um, Indigenous students who are in more rural and remote communities that don't have access to reliable inter internet. Um, broadband is an issue and they might not even have appropriate kinds of technology in order to support online learning. And right now, um, in our undergraduate teacher education program, every class that we are offering is being delivered through online and remote instruction with the exception of our field experiences. So just yesterday we had 911 students go out for their first day in schools um, with excitement and trepidation as we see um, the COVID numbers in and around Edmonton continuing to, to rise. Um, but, but COVID has really demonstrated um, a need for flexibility in how we deliver our programs, um, how we support mental health and wellness uh, through our education clinical services, for example. Um, we offer very low cost or no cost um, psychological supports for children, youth and families and assessments. And so the move to telehealth has actually created opportunities to expand our reach um, and provide those supports, but we are also limited by our financial realities at the University of Alberta. And David, as you are well aware, just in this fiscal year alone, our budget has been cut. The Campus Alberta portion of our budget has been cut by 18% or $127 million. And so that creates tremendous challenges for us to be able to provide the kinds of supports um, we want to and that our students need. Um, and it also means that um, we are having to be really careful about how we are stewarding our um, scarce resources at a time, I think, you know, Lisa made the point at a time when budgets should not be cut, that in fact investments need to be made in, in post-secondary and K-12 education. Um, so we've certainly had our share of challenge. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're all missing our face-to-face -face connections with our students um, and with our staff and our, and our colleagues, but I think we're also finding possibilities um, in online spaces that are, that are new and unique and, and that can create um, different ways of engaging with a capabilities approach um, to education. I was just thinking about your uh, field education program taking off and the challenges that that would um, hold for, for obviously the Faculty of Education and its administration of that, but then also um, 
such uncertainty in the school, in the, in the schools uh, themselves. Um, parent, like many people, and having my children in the school. So having your students in those schools at this time is something that probably um, your field ed program has never seen before, those kinds of challenges. Yeah. All right, so I think that um, I might pick up then with my first question then to um, Professor Walker, and, and that is, so in the midst of this, um, what, what, does, what is this capabilities approach then? Um, Melon, if you could articulate that for a generalist sort of audience, um, what is the capabilities approach to student learning and development? And how, that, how, does, how does that work in, in, in tertiary education? Um, thanks, David. I'll, I'll do my best. I think the, one of the challenges with the capability approach is it looks deceptively simple but it's actually rather complicated. So I, I realize I'm sort of skating over the surface and I think if people are interested, they can, listening to this, they can pick it up and, and do some reading. Um, slightly back to front, there are actually four points I want to make before I, I say something more about the capability approach. The first thing I want to say is that the capability approach can't do everything. Um, we need to be careful, as, Lise, as uh, Ingrid Drabane says, not to overpay our hands. So it's very flexible, it's very open, it's a very attractive approach, um, but its openness means that it needs to align with, with other, sorts of, um, other sorts of ideas. So that's the first thing to make clear. Um, the second thing to make clear is that uh, if we follow um, Amartya Sen, then in relation to education, this is extremely important uh, in terms of being a capability multiplier, being a fertile functioning, being able to enable all sorts of other things. And if you look at the speech that he gave to the Commonwealth in 2006, he makes quite clear that education is instrumentally, intrinsically and socially valuable. So it's not simply, um, it's certainly not just about human capital which is important, but in his reading, this becomes subsumed into a more expansive and richer uh, capability approach. So that broadly what the capability approach does or tries to do in relation to education is to raise questions about what education can mean for a life composed of many different di dimensions, what it means for investing in aspirations and futures and how it helps us to understand what we can become and what we might be able to do. So, so that's the broad understanding of education. The third thing I want to say is that I think sometimes human development gets lost when we're talking about capabilities and the capability approach. And like any other approach, it's, it runs the risk of being domesticated. And I think it's quite important to keep anchoring the capability approach in human development values, such as empowerment, participation, well-being, sustainability, equity, and so on. So it gives, it gives that kind of values um, um, anchor, as it were, for capabilities, which stops it drifting off and becoming everything um, to, to everyone. And I also think it's important in relation to human development to try and keep linking um, the capability approach to development ethics, which in turn raises questions about oppression, the relation, relationality of capabilities and capable, capability formation, per, personal ethics, and so on. So one of the things that I find extremely attractive about the capability approach is that it enables you to locate education in relation to develop, development ethics and, and human development. Then the fourth thing I want to say is the issue of resources, because of course the capability doesn't, the capability approach doesn't focus on resources, but on what people are able to do with resources. So it, it challenges the notion that you can measure in terms of income or you can measure in terms of how satisfied people say they are. But I think it's important to also recognize that resources matter. And if you look at some of the long run studies in education and health, the outcomes are quite strongly correlated with per, per capita income. So what, what we have found in terms of our, our own research with regard to income or a lack of it in terms of our higher education students is that some kind of basic capability of being financially secure is a key condition for learning and development and learning outcomes. So um, 
you know, that that's kind of a, a proviso. I mean, the issue is, although the capability approach is saying it's not, it's not about the resources, it's what you do with them. The issue in our context is if you don't even have the resource, if you don't even have the laptop or you don't have the data, you don't have a resource to do anything with. So we have to pay attention to, to resources. And there's also been interesting work done by um, Annie Austin looking at the way in which constrained um, financial circumstances also constrain agency and the ability to to reason practically in the medium to long term about where it is that you want to go with your life because you're so focused on the the now and and how you're going to survive and get enough food and pay for your accommodation pay your fees and so on and we see this um, we see this very vividly in the data that that we collect so having said those those four things a little bit more about the capability approach the first thing to make clear is that it's an open ended approach rather than a theory um, and the kind of founder or, or the, of, of the whole, whole approach is, of course, Amartya Sen. Then you get um, capabilitarian applications. So in Nussbaum's case, she's developed a partial theory of justice. You get capability of, uh, capabilitarian applications in health and education and, and so on. And Ingrid Rabanes sort of summarizes the broad purposes to which the approach might be put. So it could be used to um, assess individual levels of well-being. It could be used to evaluate and assess social arrangements and institutions, and it could be used to look at the design of, of policies and so on. But this open-endedness for us in particular is very attractive because we think it opens space for decoloniality debates. Um, and it avoids a, a, a kind of a mono justice view. It allows a more, a more rich and a more multidimensional understanding and approach um, to justice. But when you turn to education, um, being completely open ended is obviously problematic because education is or should be concerned with equality and justice. Um, so hence, you find in capabilitarian theorizing in relation to education, there is some closing of the approach. You'll either, you might draw on um, concepts like empowerment, uh, you might draw on feminist theories, depending on, on the questions that, that you're asking. Um, so we we in education think that um, what you need is a broad approach to inside the capability approach, which adds in human rights, equity, justice, uh, and so on. But the capabilities can then act as your justice grid they become what Sen calls the informational basis of justice, in our case, in education. So you look at capabilities and functionings in order to make uh, judgments about how, how just or not just or less just a particular educational process space or sets of learning outcomes are. So individual and I think collective freedoms are then foregrounded. It's very much a freedom-based approach. So the aim of education is then to focus on people's freedoms, that is their capabilities, their opportunities, and their level of achieved well-being, their functionings, what it is they are actually able to, to be and to do. So that advantage is understood as the expansion of people's capabilities. So the wider your capability set, the more advantage you're likely to have. The narrower your capability set, the more disadvantaged you are, you are likely to, um, to be. So that the core focus on the approach is on the effective opportunities that people have to be and to do in, in ways which they have reason to value. And then people develop their own capability set based on options, resources, entitlements, and so on. And from this, they choose um, to exercise particular functioning. So, so um, agency is important. So that each person then has her own specific capability set that refers to all the things that she can be and to do and to her choices. And from this, she will choose functionings. Um, which she, which she wants to exercise, which brings an agency. What it also then introduces is what Sen calls conversion factors, which pays attention to, to social arrangements, to environmental possibilities, to structures and so on. And these shape the ability of a person to convert the resources she might have into capabilities and then into functionings. 
Um, so things like race, gender, social class will operate as conversion factors or structural factors, if you want to, um, if you want to say, which will shape possibilities for developing um, a capability set and functionings for any one, one person. And of course, these intersect, and they intersect also with context. So you've got conversion factors and context working together. So for example, a girl who is black and poor and wants to go on to university will have different opportunities from a girl who is black but middle class. They share um, gender, they share race, but income would be a differential which would, which would convert their, their opportunities in different sorts of ways. Um, and I think that I think what I'd want to say last, and, and this is I think is quite tricky for the capability approach, is that cultivating capabilities and developing these capabilities in an education space does not necessarily mean that the intersecting inequalities that face marginalized young people are transformed. And I think this speaks, David, to one of the questions that you raised as, as an add-on. What happens to to people who might have the same degree from the same institution and, and similar kinds of outcomes. How does this actually, actually work for them? And I think that's something we've got to grapple with. So I think in summary, the capability approach asks that we attend to the actual lies that each person is able to and free to live beyond aggregate numbers, which don't tell us about that. That we understand education as being instrumentally, intrinsically and socially valuable. Um, that we pay attention to resources, who has them and how much they have of them, and that we consider conversion factors and, and how these shape a capability set and choices of functionings. And I will stop there. Great, thank you very much. There's a lot there to, mm. to sort of, um, to set us up for the discussion. I think we might um, then move, uh, I think, to, to Lisa. So Lisa, feel free to, to add or, or emphasize something that you've already heard, but I did want to ask you specifically about the capabilities approach and the way you and your writings have, have juxtaposed that with um, perhaps a narrower employability focus. So employability versus capability. Um, so could you explain um, that to us a little? Sure. Um before I do, I just want to first acknowledge the work of Melanie and her group at the University um, of the Free State. Melanie's work has for many years been absolutely foundational um, in uh, understanding the capabilities approach in the context of education and in particular um, in, in higher education. What we've done in our work is our sector is more the vocational education sector and I think I need to just explain terminology a bit here. So the, um, when we talk about the college sector in Canada and in the US, basically that's the vocational education sector in other countries um, where vocational education uh, or further education includes college level education plus the trades. Um, and other uh, uh, work preparation. And so our work has been focused on that sector. And, and we've called um, capabilities in the work that we do productive capabilities for a couple of reasons. First of all, we've wanted to emphasize the conversion factors and contexts that uh, Melanie um, uh, explained. Um, that, that has been fundamental for us. And that's related to this. the second point, is that capabilities is not just an alternative word for competencies um, or competency-based education or competency-based training. So in, in, in the UK, in Australia, in South Africa, um, and uh, c countries with similar systems, and, and in a much more muted way in Canada, um, the model of curriculum that's been imposed on the college sector has been based, you know, this competency-based training approach. Um, and it focuses on workplace tasks and roles or specific um, responsibilities in jobs. It starts with the tasks and roles, not with the whole job. Um, and, that's, and that's one um, problem that it starts with. And so that's why we wanted to emphasise the conversion factors and the context because we, we, what we are talking about is 
is in applying it to in applying the capabilities approach to vocational education is the person in the context of their occupation um, as a whole, not in the context of specific workplace tasks and roles. So the person in the context of their occupation and the conversion factors that are required for them to be um, uh, a gentle, creative and innovative workers at work who um, are not necessarily under the supervision of others who are who who are not we're not trying to create the supervised worker um, in vocational education which is what I think competency-based training as does as a model of curriculum um, and so what we've faced in the vocational education sector is the domestication of the concept of capability as um, as Melanie was talking about where people use the term capability as if it was interchangeable with competency-based training or employability skills and then um, we get the paradox yes um, so the productive capabilities that we talk about is focused on occupation. So we are talking about work, but we're talking about a whole different understanding of what preparation for work um, is, is about. And so that's where, that, that's where we, we contrast it with the, um, the whole employability approach. So employability approach is based on human capital theory, where the premise is um, that the purpose of education is to prepare people for jobs for the labour market, to ensure that the labour market has the skills that um, are required. And the whole notion of employability is, is based on the premise that just because every student wants to get a job, then their education must be exclusively and narrowly focused on that job um, to the exclusion of the wider purposes of education, such as preparing students for further study and to be citizens who contribute to society, their, their community and their occupation. John Dewey, the great philosopher of education, um, has this beautiful quote um, where he says, just because we name a person through, by, by the title of their occupation, so baker, plumber, butcher, does not mean that that's all that they are. They are also a parent. They are also a member of a community. They are also a political being. And education needs to encompass all of those things. And I think that's a nice way of thinking about the purpose of education more broadly, but also particularly the purpose of um, vocational education. Now, the other problem with the employability approach is that it just doesn't work in its own terms. So it's, it's focused on preparing, in, in the vocational education sector, it's mostly focused on preparing people for specific jobs and for workplace tasks and roles in those jobs. But the problem is, unless we're talking about regulated occupations like nursing or medicine, most people in liberal market economies don't end up working in those jobs. Um, the data in Australia, which is the data I, I know the best still, shows that only 30% of vocational education graduates, 30%, end up working in the job that's directly associated with their qualification. And so the whole system just doesn't work in, in, its, in its own um, terms. So in our, in our work, we argue that, that this is just too narrow and it doesn't work and that the purposes of education are broader and should be broader. And that there are multiple levels when we think about the purposes of education or multiple actors, I suppose. Um, so if we think of society as a whole, what is the purpose of education? Well, it's for a well-educated population that underpins a democratic, inclusive, socially just and sustainable society that has a thriving economy, culture, political institutions, that sort of thing. For individuals, it's the capacity to flourish in their occupations and in their communities, um, to contribute to debates in society and in their, in their occupation. And we need to think about occupation in broad terms and perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. So the role of post-secondary education broadly is to help individuals develop the capabilities they need to live lives that they have reason to value, as Melanie has said. And so if that is the case, then all credentials um, 
the North American term, the term in the rest of the Anglo Anglophone world is all qualifications, um, is to help individuals develop the capabilities they need um, to enter the labour market and to move in the labour market, either laterally or um, to higher level positions, to study at a higher level and to contribute as citizens to their communities and families. And if all education, including vocational education, did that, particularly in vocational education, it would probably look quite different. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I was just thinking about that the word vocation itself as well has, yeah. has come to me, has come to change yeah. what it's meant over time as well. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't have the same resonance to the way you describe vocation then, Lisa, um, for many people today. It's become much narrower. So, so the, the word vocation comes originally from um, theology, you know, a calling, a calling to the priesthood, a calling, you know, um, to the religious order. Um, and in our work, we, we probably, that is the implicit meaning that underpins vocation, you know, that people should be able to work in an area which they find intrinsically meaningful um, and where they can see themselves building a life and a career. Um, and that still exists to some extent in the trades. You know, um, uh, my son was an electrician and my brother was a refrigeration mechanic. Um, they've, they've moved to different occupations now, but they, they both had a sense of, I am an electrician, I am um, a refrigeration mechanic. You know, like it, they found meaning and value um, in, in their work. And when we look at a range of occupations, I've been thinking about this a little bit, we talk about someone uh, who is a lawyer, who is a teacher. It is, they are that, they have become that. Um, but when we talk about a lot of jobs for which people prepare, people are prepared in vocational education, it's something that they work in. I work in hospitality, you know, I work in retail. It's not that I am, you know. And so what we are trying to do, I suppose, in our work is to reinvigorate that notion of, um, of, of a, a broad occupation which people find meaning in and to be intrinsically worthwhile. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was just saying to Melanie before we began, I hope they can get this right now, that there's one definition of vocation that I've heard that I've liked, and I can't remember the author, but it's something like one knows one, when one has a vocation when one's heart's deep gladness meets the world's great need. Yeah. That expansive um, conception. And actually, that's one of the things that attracted me to the capabilities approach in my work was this um, a sense of of that, yeah, the possibilities of, of becoming and being something which is um, attractive and which one would want to, to be. So I guess it's an emphasis on ontology as well as much as um, just what you might happen to narrowly know in a particular circumstance. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, um, Professor Topper then, uh, obviously the teacher identity I mean, you know, one could say it's uh, historically it changes and what have you, but it still does occupy a, um, an important um, place um, materially, but also sort of in the imaginary of people. So when you think about the preparation of, you know, or when you're educating pre-service teachers, I guess, um, what are some of the core abilities or capabilities you're looking to instill in those? Um, students uh, to enable them to do their work with with that kind of um, integrity when they when they leave when they complicate thanks for the question and I'm I'm glad that Melanie and, and Lisa both made reference to intersectionality because that's um, that's something I think is very has to be very much part of how we are educating um, our pre-service teachers to think about the young people that they will be alongside. And we may or may not in this province have a leader who referred to intersectionality as a kooky academic theory. So, so I, I think I just wanted to recognize and, and acknowledge the importance of that. So one of the things like education is K-12 education is, is a very interesting space. Historically, going back to John Dewey, there's been recognition that the purpose of education 
is for citizenship in, in however that is conceived and understood, but a recognition that um, it is about uh, helping young people to engage in democratic processes, in a democratic society. But at the same time, education has been a place where dominance is reproduced over and over and over again. And, and curriculum is, is very ideological. And we continue to exist in, in a space where um, curriculum privileges certain kinds of knowledges identities, intersecting identities. And so students, some students' identities are affirmed by what they experience um, through mandated curriculum. Um, and I want to be really clear about that, not necessarily the, the lived curriculum that they experience in schools and in classrooms, but certainly through the mandated curriculum. And, and other students' identities and experiences are, are ignored or disappeared through mandated curriculum. Uh, Justice Murray Sinclair, who led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, said education got us into this mess and we need education to get us out of this mess. Um, so in order to do that, we really need to think in faculties of education about how we resist sort of this technical rationalist discourse of, of educating teachers. And so that it is, it's, it's not just a focus on discrete skills, although certainly there are skills that all teachers uh, need to have in order to be successful in the classroom. Um, but it is sort of expanding that and saying, yes, there are skills that you need to know, but those skills always need to be um, framed, understood, shaped in the context of theory. Um, and so it's that theory pract practice nexus that contributes to um, more of a capabilities approach to teacher education. Um, so I think we, we got a gift um, in Alberta a few years ago from the previous government um, to help us really um, engage our students in these conversations about what those uh, capabilities are, what those, what those qualities um, are that they need to bring to a classroom in order to create the conditions for all children to flourish. Uh, regardless of where they are situated um, socioeconomically, uh, racially, um, they're, they're, whether there's able, they, they have challenges, etc. So, so all of those intersecting pieces. And so I want to talk just for a moment about um, th this document that we have now in Alberta. And, and although the language could be critiqued um, as advancing um, some technical rationalist discourse. I think that there's potential in it. And so this, these are the teacher quality standards. And so all of our students that graduate from the Bachelor of Education program um, need to meet in a preliminary way those teacher quality standards. And then the expectation is that over a teacher's career, they will continue to um, demonstrate their ability to meet those standards. But to me, this is where the where we see the opening for a capabilities approach. Um, and I, I just want to acknowledge that that Melanie and Lisa are much more sophisticated in their knowledge and understanding of a capabilities approach than I am. I'm sort of earlier on in my engagement with it. Um, so this is preliminary thinking on my part. Um, but but the key areas of focus in the teacher quality standards in Alberta include fostering effective relationships. And so this is um, further described as acting with fairness, respect, integrity, demonstrating empathy and a genuine caring for others, inviting First Nations, Métis, Inuit parents and caregivers, elders, knowledge keepers, cultural advisors and local community members into schools and classrooms. And that teachers will engage in career-long learning. They will seek out and critically review and apply educational research to improve practice. So it's not practice on its own. It's practice informed by educational research. Um, that they will enhance their understanding of First Nations, meeting Inuit worldviews, cultural beliefs, languages, values, histories, perspectives. They'll demonstrate a professional body of knowledge in order to meet the learning needs of every student in their classroom. They'll plan and design learning activities that consider relevant local, provincial, national, and international context and issues. They'll build student capacity for acquiring, applying, and creating new knowledge, critical thinking, and assessing, interpreting, and evaluating information from diverse sources. 
They'll establish, promote, and sustain inclusive learning environments where diversity is embraced and every student is welcomed, cared for, respected, and safe. Uh, being aware of and facilitating responses to the emotional and mental health needs of students, and applying foundational knowledge about First Nations, Métis, Inuit, understanding the historical, social, economic, and political implications of treaties and agreements with First Nations, legislation and agreements with Métis, uh, the residential schools and their ongoing legacies, and they'll enhance knowledge of all students to develop a knowledge and understanding of and respect for histories, cultures, languages, contributions, perspectives, experiences, and contemporary contexts of First Nations, Métis, Inuit students. Um, and so I see this document as creating those points of entry in teacher education programs to really take up a capabilities approach as opposed to um, an over-reliance on uh, a narrow technical rational skills-based approach. But at the same time, I think this document exists in tension with some of the other things that we are seeing happening in our province, including um, a curriculum renewal process that I worry will actually um, further entrench a uh, very narrow focus on discrete knowledge outcomes um, as a measure of teaching and learning in the province. And also that um, curriculum will become, um, what's the word, more teacher proof. And, and so these are the tensions, I think, between um, the quality standards that we are being asked to um, take up in teacher education and in K-12, but the curriculum renewal process that we are seeing unfold right now um, and some of the ideologies that are influencing that process. Um, so, so overall, as I said earlier, in our faculty, we are talking extensively um, about the ways in which we can support our students to engage in culturally responsive and anti-oppressive pedagogies so that it is not just about um, discrete pieces of knowledge that we can check a box on, but helping our students and ourselves think about the complexities of education, both in terms of the possibilities to advance anti-oppressive and anti-colonial education, but also the ways in which education can reproduce um, oppressive practices and colonial practices as well. Um, and finally, I would say, David, that in the midst of all of this, um, there is some urgency to work with our students um, in consideration of the massive fragmentation of public discourse and the imperative of developing pedagogical approaches that advance not just the knowledge, what you know, of course, but how you engage in society and in ongoing learning over the course of a lifetime. Maybe, Lisa, just, just a quick little response there. I know that your work has, um, has really looked at trying to understand how um, particular skills for particular jobs aren't necessarily sort of transferable um, in the same way. And we can't just rely on these generic skills uh, mm. for people to be able to sort of do particular kinds of work. So with teachers, you know, there's certain... Um, certain capabilities which would be specific to their context in which they do their teaching, uh, which isn't necessarily transferable. But you've spoken about that in your work, is that right? Uh, so, so we don't actually think there is such a thing called generic skills, um, be, you know, because the, the broad context of the occupation matters so much. Um, so we, we have, first of all, we have generic skills, and then we have on from that employability skills. So that's you know, an even narrower version of generic skills. And then we have 21st century skills, which I think are even a bigger problem. Um, and and the, the reason they're a problem is, well, because first of all, they're focused, they're, they're, their main focus is on preparation for a narrowly defined conception of what a job is. And secondly, the, it's based on this sort of additive model of credentials. You know, we add a bit here, we take a bit from over there, and we put it together. And the credential is the sum of all the bits that, that you've added up. So it's a very atomistic approach to thinking about education rather than starting with the person in the context of their occupation. But just to give you an example, this is the example that, that we use very often in our work of problem solving skills. Problem solving skills is, is one of the key generic skills. Um, 
I would argue that problem solving, if you're an early childhood worker working in a childcare centre in a room, in the two-year-old room, and they, that you've got a big group of kids having a meltdown, um, that that is, you have to draw on different knowledge and skills and attributes to solve that problem compared to if you were an oil worker on an oil rig and there's a fire and you've got to put it out. In each case, um, the, the person in that context has to draw on completely different knowledge and skill in order to solve that problem. So we think that it's far better to think in terms of preparing people for a broad field of practice um, rather than uh, just focusing on a specific set of generic skills, which is what vocational education policy does in many countries um, around the world. And so I explained earlier that apart from regulated occupations, most people don't end up working in the job for which they're trained. But generally speaking, engineers don't want to be childcare workers and childcare workers don't want to be engineers as a general rule, right? Um, and so we think it's, it's better to think about broad fields of practice that we are preparing people for in terms of the whole person for that field of practice and to not think too narrowly about that. And another problem which education confronts but cannot solve um, is the fragmentation of occupations. Um, and so uh, the example that I use is um, care work. We... In, in many in Australia, we prepare people for aged care, uh, disability care, drug and alcohol, um, or or whatever, um, rather than the broad field of care work. Um, so thinking, so we, so the um, um, Melanie said earlier that capabilities approach can't do everything, and education. I would add to that, education also can't do everything. Education can't solve problems of unemployment and um, or problems of labour market structures. And so we need to, if we're thinking about what capabilities mean in society, we need to also think about the structures of the labour market um, and um, how they need to change and how education can support that. So one way we can support that, so for example, in care work, is to prepare care workers who can work with elderly people in their homes who may have a range of disabilities. Um, so it's, it's rethinking the nature of work and capabilities approach can prompt that and education can prompt that, but we also need to think sp explicitly about those, about labour market structures as well. I just want to make one, a, a few brief comments on, on what Jennifer said and what Lisa said. I, I found it both really fascinating and, and thank you for that. Um, I mean, it occurred to me in relation to the, the standards document, um, that you described, that it, it might be possible to, to sort of ask the question if, you know, if this is what teachers are expected to do, what, is it, what are the kind of key capability dimensions which then have to be developed through teacher education in order that they can do these things? And then working against the, um, the fragmentation that Lisa mentioned, the fact that the capability approach is always multidimensional, so it wouldn't just be a case that we uh, we develop this aspect of of teachers, but we look at it in a in a holistic, uh, um, as as Lisa said, sort of preparing the whole person for a broad field of practice. So so I think there are lots of kind of really interesting ideas there. Melanie, so within the capabilities approach itself, there's this fundamental distinction between capabilities, which are a little bit more abstract, and then the, uh, what I call functionings. And that bit is not always easy for people to sort of understand, mm. uh, I would say. <laughs> so if you could um, give us a little understanding of, of what that might be, and then, and then I want you to further think about how it's enacted in particular programs of higher education. So for instance, we know that Martha Nussbaum, the famous American philosopher, has come out with a list of certain capabilities or what she thinks um, should be involved. I'm just wondering if, if you sort of have this list behind you for your graduate students that you're thinking about in terms of their capabilities or functions that you're trying to sort of um, help them achieve. 
Um, in terms of the difference between capabilities and, and functions, and, and maybe I'll try and say something about learning outcomes, which I don't actually know that much about, but I'm trying to understand the debates. Um, I mean, you know, put very simply, uh, because functionings are, uh, are beings and doings, they are observable. So we can see uh, that a child is able to read a book, for example, or we can see that um, a carer of the elderly is, is able to do particular things in, t in, in relation to the care work that, that she undertakes. So when, um, when uh, people try and evaluate the approach, it's generally in terms of functionings because these are observable in, in some ways. Um, they can be seen, they can be talked about. Um, but capabilities are, are potentials, they are opportunities, so they, they are more abstract. So you can extrapolate them from functionings in terms of uh, people might have reason to value particular functionings, whether or not they're able to exercise them. So they might value um, being able to speak out in a public meeting, but not be able to do so um, because of the particular circumstances, but they still have, they still value that as a capability which they would like to have if circumstances were different. Um, so, so it's kind of the difference between um, being able to participate in learning, to be able to participate in learning, to have the opportunity to participate in learning, and actually participating in learning. It's the difference between um, being able to be an epistemic contributor and actually being an epistemic contributor. So the one is an opportunity, a possibility, the potential, and then the functioning is the actual operationalization or the realization of that particular opportunity or, or in some cases not being able to to realize it so what we're trying to uh, work with in the the Murato project with the lo with low income youth is to think about um, functionings as learning outcomes so a functioning could be a learning outcome but it would be aligned with the capability approach in a rich rather than a reductionist way so the the um, and, and, and I'll come back to that. But the other thing to say is that functionings are observable, but they're not the only thing that we need to pay attention to. And, and in education, I think you've got to look at capabilities and you've got to look at functionings. I think you need to look at both of those things. So we might, for example, have um, two young people who have the same degree with the same result at the same, from the same university. So that, that's a functioning. Um, but it doesn't tell us about the opportunities each of them had to achieve that degree with that result at that university. So, you know, a student from a low income background might have had to, to struggle very much harder to reach that result. And if her circumstances has been, had been better, she might actually have been able to do better, say, than achieving a, a second class pass. So, so we need to look at the underlying capabilities as well as the functionings. They both actually um, matter. And then when we look at the capabilities and the functionings, inevitably we raise questions about the conversion factors. Um, and, and who is able to, to achieve one thing and, and not the other. So um, I, I don't know how clear or muddled that is. It kind of seems clear to me that there's a potential and an opportunity and there's an actual being and doing. So the, the potential or the opportunity to think critically and then actually being able to exercise that functioning as a critical thinker and, and what enables that or what gets in the way both of the capability level or at the, the functioning level. Um, so, so what we've done, and it's, it's, it's slight, it might be going slightly off the point, I recognize, but um, you were raising the issue of which capabilities matter, how do we decide them, do we have a list? Uh, so Nussbaum, of course, has a very specific fixed list of 10 capabilities, which she argues are universal and can be applied across um, all contexts. And this is somewhat uh, controversial. It, it, it is a helpful approach, but it's controversial in terms of who decided. Did the philosopher theorist decide that this is what should be on, on the list? And is, is the issue of this being a universal list really the case? So, so there are problems, I think, with notions of fixed lists. And I would never advocate 
a fixed um, list of education capability. She has three, um, the examined life, um, the nourish of imagination and, and global citizenship, which, which are, are broad enough, I guess, to do, to do something with. So what, what we've done across different projects is try to generate sets of dimensions, sets of capability dimensions, which work for a particular context um, and, and particular groups of students. So then it might look different if you're looking at issues around gender and education. It might look different um, if you're looking at low income students. Then thinking of them in multidimensional ways and thinking about the kind of key functioning that would go with the capability. So the ones, the eight which have come out of the, the Murato data um, and where we think the functionings can be understood as learning outcomes. So we've got um, the capability to be an epistemic contributor. So both to give and receive from the common store of knowledge. A nourish of capability, which is hugely important for for everybody actually, but perhaps particularly so for marginalized youth, to actually have the opportunity in the space to tell their story uh, of their experiences in higher education. Uh, practical reasoning, because this, uh, this is the space in which people think about what is a good life for them and the choices that they make. I mean, in our context, Ubuntu is a really important capability and something similar might be important in indigenous communities in Canada and probably ought to be important for all Canadians. But this notion that uh, my well-being turns on your well-being. So if you have ill-being, then I cannot have well-being. Something, something has to happen in between. And it's kind of a form of citizenship, but it's not quite this, the, the same thing. Um, then inclusion and participation. This uh, belonging in teaching and learning in the university and communities and so on. Um, the capability for further work and or further study. Um, uh, the capability for emotional balance. So the students across the, the four waves of life history interviews talk a lot about, about stress, um, about the difficulties of trying to focus on, on work when they're unhappy or things aren't, aren't working for them and so on. And then uh, a navigation capability, which we take out of Yosso's work on, on capabilities, this ability as a low income student to navigate the culture, the processes and the procedures of the university. And the key functioning, as I said, of each of those would then be a learning outcome of a different kind working in this multi-dimensional way. But ours have come out of empirical data around many conversations in in the research team, they they shaped um, by a particular context, that they shaped by our, by our constitution, um, and so on. But you know, put simply, the capability is the potential and the opportunity, and the functioning is actually realizing it, operationalizing it. Um, it it's the being and the doing. I don't know if that's clear. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And so I'm going to move to uh, to Lisa and then Jennifer, but. Um... I can't, it's been a while since I've read Amartya Sen, but it, was he an Aristotelian from his background? Was he, was he trained that way? Um, do you Nuss, know? Nussbaum uh, is, is the that, Aristotelian. Just that potentiality and act thing that you're describing in capability functionings. Anyway, that's, that doesn't matter. Um, uh, so I think you've given us a, a helpful understanding there. So, uh, and also the way that one would generate particular functions, functionings, which could be sort of analogous to learning outcomes, but in a very contextually sort of specific way. I'm just um, thinking, Lisa, is there anything that you would add there in terms of that, the functions or functionings, um, particularly as that which is observable and then um, potentially, you know, accessible as well? And then, therefore, they can sort of guide sort of your assessment or curriculum uh, pedagogy and assessment within, um, within, in your case, vocational education. Is that is that some of the work that you've done? Yeah, I think one of the um, problems that we all have when we undertake research and you know um, think about things like the capabilities approach is that we're always responding to something specific. Um, you know, and, and, and in my case, I've been responding to competency-based training because that's what I've actually had to work with since the 90s um, when I started as a teacher in a college and this model of curriculum was imposed. 
And competencies are heaps of lists. Like there's always lists um, of competencies. And they're not necessarily related to each other. There's not necessarily any internal coherence. And so beca because that's been the context in which I've been working, I haven't, I've sort of, there, there is a debate in vocational education um, research, you know, should we have a list? Um, and I've always felt very nervous about the idea of a list because of that context. So in work that we've done recently for Education International, which is the International Federation of Teacher Education Unions, um, and we, we, did, uh, we looked at eight countries, um, and the question we asked is, what role can technical and vocational education and training TVET play in supporting social justice? Um, and four of those countries were in 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 country studies. Um, what we tended to do in in that work was to focus more on the institutional preconditions for capability. Um, and and part of the reason we did that is because um, the vocational education sector is the most privatised of all sectors um, because of its pro because of its putative purpose, which is you know this narrow preparation for work. And so we've tended to focus on what would it take for TVET to support social justice. And, and we've tended to focus on things like strong institutions, um, well-qualified, well-resourced teachers, you know, those sorts of things we think that are necessary. So where does that leave learning outcomes? Well, again, I'm responding to what I've had to deal with since the, since the 90s. And, um, in my context, learning outcomes have become so debased, it's, it's very hard to have a, um, a, a rational conversation. And learning outcomes tends to, I think, um, try to do everything, you know, from, from guide um, p particular pedagogic strategies and class lessons, um, you know, a lesson plan, to, you know, system design. Um, and everything in between and that's one of the problems of it and that's also gives you an indication as to, as to why it is a problem because it's designed to count and to measure and to evaluate um, and that's its primary purpose um, and so so what should we be doing instead well I think learning outcomes can play a very modest role but it's 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 very modest you know it can help um, provide students with a um, a map of where they're going and people have noted that when I teach I always have learning outcomes because I've been so well trained you know I can't not have them you know I've been teacher trained I've got to have them um, and uh, and it's to give a map as to where we're going to go in that class but that's about it um, and, not, and and just recently I led the program re evaluation review you know the quality assurance the seven-year quality assurance review um, for our program and we were having to deal with province-wide frameworks and I found it completely irrelevant um, in terms of describing what we do and the purpose and 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 in terms of evaluating um, our program we were being evaluated on data that was really crappy um, you know non-existent you know and didn't actually measure what it was claiming um, to measure and I think that's the problem it's being used as a policy lever as part of the evaluative state, um, you know, in which um, everything is trying to be measured. And its, and its limited role is exaggerated and therefore debased in terms of what it can do, even in that limited way. And it's disconnected from the actual idea of occupations, you know, in terms of their, their broad role. Uh, and so, I mean, so putting all that, so I don't like them much, right? I mean, that's clear. So I think, you know, we don't have too much time left now. So I'd like to turn to Jennifer and then think specifically about um, what your faculty has done around um, whether you want to call them learning outcomes or just curriculum innovations to enable uh, students to more adequately be prepared for life and work with Indigenous peoples here in Alberta and beyond. Um, if you could speak to that and then think about, yeah, just, just what sort of efforts of curriculum reform are necessary and, and teaching changes are necessary to be able to accomplish something as difficult as that. Uh, 
Yeah, thanks for the question. And my um, head is spinning because I'm reflecting on what Lisa's just said and thinking about what Melanie has offered. And there's so much richness um, in this conversation. Um, so maybe what I what I just want to say first, David, in in response to something that that Lisa said is that we continue to operate in an educational conduct or context that sort of um, advances the deficit understanding of students. They're deficient if they don't meet certain standards, outcomes. Um, teachers, uh, you know, operate within that deficit model themselves. I'm thinking, Lisa, about um, the implementation in Ontario of this math exam for all student teachers. Um, they now have to register for this math exam, take this standardized test in order to um, be certified uh, to teach. And, and what does that tell us about their abilities to teach students well and holistically? It tells us, it tells us very little. And so I offer those two pieces in the context of thinking about our commitments to doing education differently in service to um, Indigenous students. Um, and, and I think that, that there's a real tension or, or a real bumping between um, these um, evaluative uh, pieces of education and, and what we could be doing differently um, to, to advance education for Indigenous learners. And, and what is good for Indigenous learners, let me be clear, is good for all students. A different way of, of framing um, learning, different opportunities uh, to, to take up um, experiences that, that sit sometimes within formal curriculum, but very often outside of formal curriculum, and, and where, where is meaning made? Um, so, you know, at the U of A, we're, we're doing some good work, and, and I'm proud of some of the work that we're doing, but, but it's not enough, and it, and it will probably never be enough um, until which time we, we have a, an educational system in this province, in this country, that is not um, underpinned by colonialism and, and the ongoing realities of a colonial state. So our students, all of our teacher education students, um, you know, engage in a required course that is meant to help them um, gain some foundational knowledge of the, the history of Canada um, from the perspective and experiences of Indigenous people. It's meant to challenge uh, settler colonial consciousness, which is so easily reproduced in kind of normative um, mainstream K-12 spaces. Um, we have a newly formed Indigenous curriculum making program area in our elementary education program that is creating entry points for our students to think about what it means to be alongside Indigenous learners and all learners um, in more meaningful ways where the experiences and the lives and the, the intersecting identities of, of young children and their families are, are part of um, how we are shaping teaching and learning in, in K-12. But, but the reality is this, that the university is still a colonial institution with colonial systems and structures, and K-12 education is still very much a colonial system that, that has for, for decades and decades and decades worked hard to ensure that um, whiteness and colonialism can be reproduced in very... Um, careful ways. And, and so I think that there are things that, that teachers can be doing um, in their classrooms and that schools can be doing. And indeed, in the province, we see a lot of, a lot of effort um, undertaken to um, advance education for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit students and, and to live up to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. But but at, but at the end of the day, we are still seeing similar outcomes at the end of grade 12, and that is a disproportionate number of Indigenous students not finishing school, a disproportionate number of Indigenous students not able to access post-secondary education for a variety of reasons, 
And if they do, to go back to Melanie's example earlier about two students going to the same university, enrolled in the same degree program, but with different life circumstances, the outcomes can be very different. And that is true for Indigenous learners at the University of Alberta too. So we, we in our faculty, we don't have, we don't have an answer to this um, persistent challenge, but what we do have is a commitment to continue to um, challenge structures and processes that contribute to deficit understandings. And I think that these, these deficit understandings are, are, are really embedded in those sort of narrow um, outcome-based approaches to education that we see um, at, uh, being co continually advanced. Um, and even actually, I would say more so recently um, with, with the the rise of different kinds of governments um, in our country and around the world. Um, so I, I, I'm optimistic, but I'm also realistic and not naive enough to say that, that we've solved the problem and just because we have um, a commitment to anti-oppressive education doesn't mean that um, we are able to, um, what's the word that Melanie used? Um, the being and the doing, right? And so, so you can you can know and you can understand, but but how are you able to enact that within a structure that makes it incredibly challenging and difficult to enact? So maybe that's where Thank I'll you. stop. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That's really, yeah, really interesting and challenging. Um, I'm dying to say something. Yeah, I'm well, I was just going to invite you in at this point, um, Melanie, to say something yeah. about you know obviously the decolonization. Mm -hmm process I'm, in South I'm, Africa as well as as well as the capabilities mm. framework and whether or not you're feeling that the capabilities approach is actually advancing that historic yeah. sort of process yeah. and then just to open it up to for final comments yeah. at this point. um thanks David and I'm sorry to sort of push in but I, I I just found that so interesting I think the challenge of decoloniality is huge because you're talking about a centuries old process of, of knowledge, practices and types of knowledge and particular cosmovisions operating um, in a particular way. Um, so so we, we really like to see the Santos's notion of an ecology of knowledges, which admits many different cos cosmovisions. So in relation to indigenous people, I think it's not just about learning alongside. It is gen, it's, um, I think it, it's Goethe who talks about the importance of epistemic humility, of, of understanding what, you know, where, where the boundaries are of your, of your own knowledge and, and actually doing something about that and being, in, being an epistemic agent. So what, we, um, what we've done is we've drawn on uh, Miranda Fricker's work quite a lot, her work on epistemic justice, and brought that into conversation with the capability approach. And in a sense, if, um, if teacher education did nothing else, I mean, if it, if, if it could actually develop the capability and functioning of being an epistemic contribution, contributor in its, its full, fullness and its richness, then that might take uh, take us a step further in terms of of dismantling um, decoloniality and so on. I mean, decolonization is a narrow issue, um, more specific to to curriculum and and what knowledge you admit into to the curriculum and and so on. But the but it's the decoloniality that's that's the more difficult thing to to shift. And of course, it, embedded in this is the notion of what it means to be a human being. Um, and what kind of a human being and who counts as a full human being, which is what the struggles of people like Fanon and Steve Biko uh, for this, this, Im this imagined self who's ethical, compassionate, um, and, and so on, is, is, is at the heart of that. Uh, you know, can the capabilities approach deal with this? Well, it, it can and it should, but it, it's not doing it very well, I have to say at the moment, as, as part of that capabilitarian community. I think the attention to to decolonization and decoloniality is actually quite uh, quite fragile at the moment. And I think philosophers in particular really struggle to understand um, that there's nothing inherently universal about Western philosophy. Western philosophy is Western philosophy. Uh, but even in the capabilities community, there's a tendency to understand 
philosophies from other parts of the world underpinned by different cosmovisions is ethno-philosophy. And it's really frustrating um, because it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's not, not the case. There's nothing universal about Western-dominated and Western-produced uh, knowledge. And we all, you know, we, we try, we understand this, we recognize the entanglement of knowledges. But for us, the issue is to, to recenter Africa in our particular case and and to you know for that to be our our stopping off point and and one of the one of the other things that we do is we work with the notion of colonial conversion factors so if you're going to be talking about conversion factors very specifically what are the colonial conversion factors which are at play here which is going to bring in history and and power and so on and and one of the weaknesses i think in nussbaum's work is she doesn't pay attention to to history um, and in our case, that is, and, and in your case as well, that's so bound up with notions of colonialism, coloniality, and, and, and the perpetuation of that through education systems. So I think it's a huge challenge, but I think it's absolutely fascinating um, to, to work with and, and to, to work with young people who are going to be teachers in schools and, and who have so much to learn. Uh, from uh, from indigenous cosmovisions and and different um, knowledge ecologies and so on. So I'll I'll stop there. Thank you, um, Lisa. Any final thoughts and comments on what you've heard? Then, sure. I I, I in terms of translating it back to my context and the sector that that I work with, um, what are the issues there? And I mean what. What I really like is some work that was done in the European Union um, using the capabilities approach, working with uh, disadvantaged young people who weren't in employment, educational training. Capabilities approach can't promise, um, in, when applied to education, can't promise jobs. It, it can't solve unemployment. It can't solve the bigger problems of society. It can't be solved without education. Those problems can't be solved without education, but education on its own can't solve it. So when you, so in the current context with COVID and everything where we've got massive unemployment, massive graduate unemployment, graduate unemployment from diplomas and so on, what, what does it mean um, to, to ensure that we have an approach underpinned by capabilities? And what are the outcomes? Well, what they did in that work in the EU, which is really nice, is that they said that when we're applying in, in and they were contrasting this to employability, you know. So the notion of employability is get a job, any job, doesn't matter what it is, right? Any job is better than, than no job, which isn't exactly true, but that, that's another um, debate. Um, and what they said is that capability should, we, we, we should be seeking to do three things um, with uh, capabilities in education and in vocational education. One is to ensure that um, young people have the capabilities they need for work um, and to be able to work in jobs that they, you know, find meaningful um, and to be able to work in their, in their broad field. The second thing is that they should have capabilities to undertake higher level studies, um, you know, so they should be able to progress educationally in the same or related field. And the third is that they should have capability of, for voice, that is the capacity to articulate um, their own aspirations and what they want and to have a say in what happens in their lives. Um, and I think that, that when we're thinking about capabilities right now, that those three things I think are, are good because they're underpinned by a concept of justice, right? And that people have a right to have a say in what happens in their own lives. And so that's the way I've translated the broad issues that we've been talking about into what does it mean in terms of the scholarly community that I work in and the sector that, that I work in. Thank you, Lisa. And then final thoughts from Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful for this conversation. Um, I think that Melanie made some really um, important points about um, you know, colonial conversion factors and, and and the need to um, consider the institutional preconditions for capabilities. Um, so I will say that, that in our context, um, 
we are, we are noticing that young people are desirous of these kinds of conversations about what it means to um, advance social justice, what it means to um, engage in working toward a better world. And they, their eagerness for the conversations does give me a hopefulness for, for what is possible and how they will translate their learning in our faculty into their practice in K-12. But it, it, it needs to always, of course, be more than, than the individual um, and their capacity to, to make change in their own context, although I certainly recognize the importance. And, and just to circle back again to a point that Melanie made, there does need to be that self-awareness, that self-reflexivity, and it has to be self-reflexivity that, that is consistent over an entire career, and so that we are constantly reflecting and, and learning and growing and thinking about what it means to do the work that we are doing wherever that work is, is situated. And finally, I'll say, um, to the sort of narrowing of um, focus, government's focus on, on employability, job readiness, you know, these discrete skills. And, and I hear often about, you know, the training of teachers. And, and I would say that in education, we are, we are trying to advance a discourse about, um, we, we are trying to bring back the discourse of, of critical citizenship education as core to the work of education um, and to, to push back against this idea that all we do in faculties of education is train teachers. We educate educators who find themselves situated in a variety of different contexts and and some of the capabilities that I described earlier are essential for them to be able to, to flourish and create the conditions for flourishing in, in those contexts that they, that they live and work in. And so I'll just end it there. I've been inspired by your uh, wisdom today and it's given me a shot in the arm to keep going. I often think at, at times where a lot of people question the, the relevance and, and purposes of, of a university education and our students uh, hear those things as they can. We, we have to be able to let students know that this can be a place where you can explore what is ultimately meaningful for you and not simply um, help you get a meal ticket. And so um, that's been an inspiring conversation for me today. So thank you very much for your, your participation.